It's a pleasure for all of us to be here for the second, for the second time around um, to this special award sponsored by the Tisch family to honor their father, whose passion for civic participation and leadership was renowned in this city and well beyond. The Aspen Institute is honored to be the grant recipient for this wonderful series of conversations and for this special award, uh, conversations with great leaders, and we hope you've attended some of these before, um, leaders who inspire and educate. Um, last year, we had the, the, the honor of, of giving the award to Wynton Marsalis um, at the, with the very first award. And this year, as we gather again uh, for the second, and you'll hear more about um, the award and the awardee very, very shortly. Um, to do that, it's my pleasure to introduce Lori Tisch, herself a tireless and imaginative philanthropist and role model for so many who thoughtfully want to give back to their communities, uh, their city, and to their country along with her brother Steve and John, and her mother, who's here tonight as well. Um, we thank the entire Tisch family for uh, fulfilling this most wonderful idea and plan. Thank you very much, Lori. Thank you, Susan. I'm not sure if you said tireless or tired. <laughs> and, I'm and, I'm, and I'm happy to report that the reason I'm tired is that I just returned uh, not very long ago uh, from China on an incredible trip uh, put together by the Aspen Institute and uh, the Asia Society, and Vishaka Desai is here. Um, as um, <laughs> the never tired um, head of the Asia Society, and I, I didn't know that much about the Asia Society um, before the trip, now, <laughs> now I know lots. And um, I, we'll, we'll save what, what I learned for another night, but all I can say is, is with Bishaka at the helm, um, US-China relations are in terrific, terrific shape. So Bishaka, thank you for organizing the trip and thank you for your education. Um, it, was, it was spectacular. Um, Bishaka also just told me that um, the panels are all going to be online, and I urge all of you to, when you get a chance, to take a look at what went on uh, with the Aspen Institute and um, uh, Asia Society in China. Um, now, how am I going to segue to Billie Jean King? Billie Jean, have you played many matches in China? <laughs> well, you should. Um, anyway, um, so Susan talked a little bit about the award, um, and I'm going to give some brief remarks in, in a few minutes, but I think it's first um, I would like to introduce uh, a short video about Billie Jean King, and I think when you see this video, it will be very, very clear why she is the second um, recipient of the Preston Robert Tisch Award for Great Leadership. that it's a stretch to say that Billie Jean King is the single most important person in the history of women's sports. She's been the biggest influence in my life outside my family. She wanted more for not only women in sports, to give them an opportunity to come and play on equal terms, but also the way we guys look at women now in the boardroom. We honor what she calls all of the off the court stuff and to give everyone regardless of gender or sexual orientation including my two daughters a chance to compete both on the court and in life women's tennis never had the cachet that men's tennis had when it came time for the guys to make money in an honest way they had no interest in bringing the women along. By the mid-60s, first year I won singles, I thought, this is ridiculous. Look at all these people paying money to come and watch us. We're not getting any of it. 
She was so principled about it, and it's so logical that women should be paid the same as men. She decided we've got to set up our own equivalency of what the men are doing. Unless we got together as a group, we weren't we're going to have any power or say as to what prize money was available for us. When we played at a tournament with the guys, the ratio of prize money was usually 11 or 12 to 1. It wasn't just that they were rebelling. They were risking absolute banishment from tennis. The women were scared because the USLPA told us they weren't going to let us play in any tournaments anymore. They said, well, we're going to lose everything. I said, we've got buckets. We've got nothing. We have, we have nothing to lose. Along with her being so revolutionary, she's so important to me because I wouldn't be able to play on the WTA tour without her. I think I was 14 years old when Billie Jean King played Bobby Riggs. I actually was a 14-year-old male chauvinist, little kid, hoping that Bobby Riggs would kick Billie Jean King's ass. But now that I'm the father of four beautiful girls, I just want to say for the record right now that I am very happy that Billie Jean King won. <laughs> Billie Jean King triumphed yeah. over the self-proclaimed male chauvinist pig, Bobby Riggs. The male is king, the male is supreme. I said it over and over again. I still feel that way. I kept thinking she must think that all of women's self-confidence and pride rests on this moment, and she was right. <laughs> it did. Billie Jean always says this. Champions adapt, and pressure is a privilege. I really wanted to start getting the, the hearts and minds of people to get in alignment with this idea of equal opportunities and rights for men and women. Women are underserved. This is the only reason I've had to spend so much time trying to help women. If boys were underserved, that's where my time would have been spent. What makes her such a role model to all of us is that she has never veered from her core values. What I admire most about Billie is what she didn't just do for tennis, but what she did for all females just across the board. Great shot! In 74, Larry and I were involved in forming World Team Tennis. We have men and women on the same team, and that's what I want the world to look like. And we thought doubles should take precedent over singles because it's a team sport. Billy's organization teaches us the power of collaboration and teamwork, and I think we can all apply that in our own lives. We really wanted whoever's playing to experience leadership role and a supportive role. It's all become a big team game. I've learned a lot from her as a business person. The world's problems cannot be solved by individuals anymore. I don't think there's any question in this century that the two most significant cultural athletic figures are Jackie Robinson and Billie Jean King. She has probably done more than any woman in the world to empower women and to educate men. She's helped to educate us all by empowering members of the GLBT community. If you have the heart of a champion, if you have the heart of Billie Jean King, you can belong, you can prevail. Thank you. I, needless to say, my remarks will be very short because it's, it's very, very obvious why Billie Jean King was chosen tonight to receive this award. Um, as Susan mentioned, this series and this award um, is given by um, me, my brother John and Lizzie Tish, my brother Steve, and my mother Joan Tish. Um, but luckily for me that since it's it's um, organized through our office at the Laurie M. Tisch Illumination Fund. I get to choose the, I, I get the first vote on the recipient. And the Aspen Institute 
sent a very long list of very, very distinguished um, potential recipients, all of whom would have been extremely worthy. Um, and it was, I, I saw Billie Jean's name on the list and immediately said, that's it. And I'm thrilled that my brother John and Lizzie and Steve went along with it. Um, so this really is a great honor. I feel like, um, as I'm standing here, I feel like, Billie Jean, we have, we have so much in common. <laughs> now, what could that be, she's wondering. Um, well, <laughs> number one, I grew up in a family of six boys, two brothers, four male cousins. <laughs> I could have used some of your negotiating skills. Um, so um, for that alone, you were always a huge fan of mine. Um, I mentioned or I was a huge fan of yours, hopefully vice versa. Um, I also mentioned to Christine that the Aspen Institute has just formed the Sports and Society uh, Board, and I'm very proud that my daughter, uh, who's in business school, Carolyn Tish Sussman, is a member of the, um, that's a, the Aspen Society Board, and my other daughter, um, Emily Tish Sussman, is a lawyer in Washington um, who is focusing on, and has been successful, um, in the overturn of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So, yeah, so um, I'm proud that we're following your leadership. But a couple of other things that maybe some people in this room don't know, um, I, have t um, I have tonight, and I wish I had worn, my um, University of Michigan letter tennis letter jacket. Now, <laughs> now, what's interesting about the fact that I have a letter jacket um, is not my tennis skill. Um, I was an alternate. But... <laughs> But the fact that I got a letter saying, Dear Early Women of Michigan. <laughs> and <laughs> exactly. Um, no, Dear Early Athletes of Michigan. Um, and they were making up for past sins by offering letter, uh, letter jackets to all athletes who played sports before Title IX. So, <laughs> so, so I now have a letter jacket also. Um, but I, I would like to say the thing that we most have in common is that we both play tennis. Um, but I think, uh, which is true, although I think my, my saying to Billie Jean King that I too play tennis is like the president of your junior high school saying to Obama, we have a lot in common, we're both in politics. <laughs> um, Anyway, so we're, we're, we're really so honored and thrilled to be able to present this award to you. Um, as you'll read in the program, and, and as Susan said, um, tonight's program um, is, celebrates individuals who are making significant impact in their community um, through areas of access to education, employment, healthcare, the arts, culture, and sports, primarily in urban settings. And, and you really embody all of that. Um, as we said, the award is given in honor of our father, uh, Bob Tisch, just a middle-class Jewish boy from Brooklyn who, with his brother Larry, purchased a hotel in 1948 in Lakewood, New Jersey, which he then uh, built in the very successful Lowe's Corporation. Um, my father was not just a great businessman, a tremendous philanthropist, but he was also a great sports lover, as demonstrated by his purchase in 1991 of 50% of the New York football giants. I, I would have been happier to say that last week or three weeks ago, but, but there's still a season and there's still hope. Now, another example of my father's love in sports, of sports, this, this is a little bit less of a shining example um, of his total grasp of the game of tennis um, was expressed that I, for many, many years, maybe 10, over 10 or 15 years, I now and then played mixed doubles with my father, and I was his often his partner. Um, for those of you who didn't know him, you might find this um, story a little bit strange. For those of you who did know him, you will find it totally a Bob Tish story. Before the game started, he would say to me, I'll take the middle, you take the two alleys. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have no doubt that Billie Jean King could have done that with extreme grace and prof proficiency. Me, not so much. But I do look back um, with incredible fondness and a little bit of sadness on um, the many, my many years of playing mixed doubles with my father. Um, it was great exercise, it was great competition, and um, he had a great love of the game, as did I, and it was a terrific way to spend time together. 
um, through our respective foundations, um, my brothers and I and Lizzie are um, really trying to carry out the legacy, the philanthropic and business legacy that he left for us. And giving this award to you is really one of the best examples that I can think of of how, how to do that. So Billie Jean, we know about your career. Um, we know that you're an incredibly talented athlete, that you put those boys in their place. Um, but tonight what we want to celebrate is your unending commitment to inspiring others to focus on social equality both on and off the court. I mean, in the name of these values, Billie Jean has founded the Women's Tennis Association, the Women's F Sports Foundation, and is the owner of World Team Tennis. Wow, I didn't know that. That's very cool. <laughs> Billie Jean um, is also an ardent fan of the First Lady's Let's Move campaign and an active member of the President's Council on Fitness, Sports, and Nutrition. In 2009, she was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom towards her work for equality for women and the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender communities. Billie Jean, you have worked tirelessly to make your lives better on many, to make all of our lives better on many different levels and have blazed a path which so many are here tonight are following. So as we said, tonight's award is about leadership. And like my father, you have elected and succeeded in changing and improving the lives of women, children, and families everywhere. Um, and you, tonight you've shown that by designating your award, which I hope you'll come up and get, um, to the Pat, John and Patty McEnroe Foundation, which supports a variety of youth, sports, and environmental organizations. So Billie Jean, please come up and accept your award. Thank you. Thank you. And on behalf of my family and, of course, my father, Preston Robert Tisch, um, it's, it's such an honor for you to accept this award. Now, just very quickly, I'd also like to introduce Christine Brennan, renowned sports journalist, tonight's moderator, and a huge, huge role model for me, but really for my girls. You're, they're such fans of yours. Um, Christine is an award-winning sports columnist who helped break down gender barriers in the 80s and 90s um, and really took over roles that have tr were traditionally male roles. Um, Christine was the first sports writer at the Miami Herald, and her book, Inside Edge, was named Sports Illustrated, one of the top 100 books of all time. So, Christine, we're so grateful to you for being able to join us tonight. Thank you. Um, oh, and... There's another part of the award that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Christine give you. <laughs> you look stronger. <laughs> oh, I'm handing this to you? <laughs> just, well, just to take a look. Um, yeah, just take a look. This is great. Yeah, so just, are we going to have a photo together with this or not? Um, I think, yeah, I think in a bit. Are we, are we going to go right to the panel now? Or? Yeah, okay, so. Lori, why don't you really stand with me for a minute so that you Okay. Can... Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> And then Chris. And Chris, why don't you come for one? Oh, you want me? Yeah, we'll no, come for one. And then with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you're nice and tall. No one you, ever wants yeah. a journalist around. Yeah, I do. Next time I'm wearing that jacket. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. It's Thank beautiful. You. I'll leave that there. Wow. Well, are hello, we everybody. Are we on? I think we're on. Can you hear us? <laughs> I think they can hear us. Yes. Okay. I just want to thank Lori and, and the family um, for this honor tonight. Um, you've given so much to all of us for so many years. And uh, I know, Lori, you're, the, I guess, the only girl of the Bob and Larry show. So um, <laughs> uh, I just, it's, it's an honor. And uh, just your family is just amazing. I mean, I, every time I read about you and every time I see one of you, um, I just go, it's just remarkable how you continue to be relentless in giving back. And you don't have to, but I just want to thank you because yeah. it just makes a difference. And then here we are at the Asia Society, which is absolutely beautiful. And I know the time change is really hurting a lot of you. So thank you. So what do we want to talk about? Are we ready to I go? I hope some of you get ready with questions because uh, 
I like I like to talk about so many different areas of things. So why don't yeah. we go for it? What do you? Well, you're the. I'll let you go because Chris King can actually speak of, on the sports or Title IX side much probably stronger than I can. So <laughs> I, I might throw it back that. to her. It just depends. No, no. Hey, this is fun. Uh, it's, first of all, it's great to have you here. Thanks yeah, so much thank for you. being here tonight. And what an honor it is for me. You know, Bill, you've heard me say this a million times, and you say enough already. But I will take 30 seconds and say that. Uh, September 20th, 1973, the day that Billie Jean King beat Bobby Riggs. Uh, I was a 15-year-old uh, sophomore in high school in the suburbs of Toledo, Ohio. A girl jock, uh, awkward, tall, my height now, almost six feet tall. And uh, we went home that night, all of us cheered for you. We had bets going on in high school. Even your dad? Even my dad. All right. Mr. Republican. Oh, he, <laughs> that's right. I know. Had, I read your book. It's he so had, funny. He had three daughters and one son, so he knew what side to cheer on. And... Um, <laughs> And, Otherwise he's but toast. that day, the, you know, our gym teacher, Sandy Osterman, we had bets going on. Maybe some of you did, too. You know, it was the boys against the girls and everyone. Okay, we're going to see you tomorrow. We'll see who wins the bet. You know, these little fun games going on. I mean, this was happening all around the country. Uh, certainly was happening in uh, the Midwest, in Toledo. And uh, we went home that night, and I was so nervous. I, I wanted you to win so badly. And... Uh, and you did in straight sets, and it was easy. Although it wasn't easy, we're going to hear no, about that in a moment. <laughs> but it sure, it sure looked easy. She, you just uh, you threw your racket in the air, and and we all were lifted up with with you at that moment. And uh, the next day, I went to school, and our my rival boy athlete, uh, my my uh, you know I was kind of the girl jock of our class, and he was the boy jock. And I saw him at the lockers, and I said, I just looked at him, I said, we win. We win. I won. And he just slammed his locker and he goes, yeah, <laughs> yes, you did. And you know what I realized, Billy, is that it was the first time I had ever seen a woman on the same stage with a man in any way, shape, or form, in culture, in politics, uh, anything, in 1973. And it was the first time I'd ever seen a woman beat a man at anything. And, um, <laughs> and what, what you meant to millions and millions of people who you had no idea we were out there, maybe you did, but as I've said many times, just one more big thank you from that 15-year-old in Toledo, Ohio. Oh, thank uh, you. And to, be, to think that I'm sitting here with you, it's just, it is a dream come true always. Uh, so why don't we start with that? September 20th, 1973, you're in the Astrodome. The match is about to start, and what are you thinking? Are you nervous? Well, it's starting. By yeah. then, I was fine. It's, it was the two months <laughs> leading up to it. I was an absolute wreck um, and very nervous and uh, thought about so many different things. And the only reason the match came about, he followed me for three years, and I kept putting him off because we just started uh, professional tennis. And uh, the women's tour is only in its third year in 1973. So you have to put it in perspective, set the scene. Uh, it was the height of the women's movement. A woman could not get a credit card on her own without a male signing. Um, we only had four television stations, the three networks plus PBS. We had no cable TV. We were going, uh, just getting touch-tone telephones. Vietnam was cooling down. Watergate was heating up. Uh, there was a lot of things going on. It was a very tumultuous time. Um, but any of you um, men, uh, a lot of you men in, the, um, in this room probably are the first, genera first generation of men of the women's movement. Uh, you may or not have connected that way, but you are, <laughs> if you're a certain age. Um, so it, it, there was a lot to it for me. And what I wanted to do, as I said in the, in the film, Title IX had been passed June 23rd, 1972, which was very important to me at the time and to many of us. And I really wanted to start changing the hearts and minds to match up with that, which was that I wanted um, men and women to network by people, help each other. I'm very idealistic. I haven't changed. I, I really, uh, I think it, um, <laughs> and I think it comes from my family background because my mom and dad were a really great team. They really loved each other and um, just were good to each other. And not saying it was perfect, didn't, of course they argued. Um, but they were always committed and they were very committed to their children. Um, my younger brother became a professional baseball player. They never pushed us, we pushed them. Uh, my brother was with the San Francisco Giants. Uh, Randy Moffat. Moffat's my birth name, in case you don't know. And he was a relief pitcher with the uh, Giants most of his career, 12 years in the majors. Uh, but to get back to the match, uh, a lot had happened. Margaret Court had lost uh, earlier that year on Mother's Day, and they call it the Mother's Day Massacre. If you don't know who she was, she ended up being 
the player who won more Grand Slams than anybody, 62. And uh, she was, at the end of 73, she was number one. I think I was number two that year. I think, I don't know. I don't really care about it anymore, but at the time I did probably. Um, but I thought about history. I thought about how can this be a positive experience? How can I make a change? How can I make a difference that will make people want to help each other? It was so ironic. Here I'm playing a guy, and I hate it when we fight. I always want us to be on the same team. Um, and it was so ironic. Here I'm against him. And, and as a, from an athletic point of view, it did not mean anything to me because he's older. In fact, he was my dad's age. He was 55 <laughs> at the time. And I thought, for me personally, as a jock athlete, it doesn't, it's not that meaningful. But what it represented and the symbolism uh, that was associated with it was so important. Uh, so um, it was so important for me to win. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought about if I lost, what the consequences could be. I thought we could lose our women's professional tour. I thought we would go backwards uh, in many, many ways uh, from uh, a cultural point of view. Uh, I thought if I could win, women would believe in themselves more, that maybe men would look at us a little differently, that they would uh, just start thinking differently. And it was amazing the emotional impact, the emotional impact that I had for two months leading up to it, how people thought about themselves, how they thought about the opposite gender, how they started to really get revved up emotionally. And I knew it was going to touch the emotional part of us. And I, it was just amazing how crazy everybody was. And there was a lot of uh, attention on it. And I knew there was going to be a lot of attention because finally, uh, and you can relate to this, over 90%, of especially back then, of the media is controlled by men. And the only time women usually get any attention, real attention, is when we become part of the men's arena. And that's the reason that, we had that I got attention, because now I'm playing a guy. Now the guys are interested because it's about them. Okay? Now this, this is true. I mean, just think about it. Do you think I would have got, I mean, I, I've won all these other titles. You think people care? They always love the fact I beat Bobby Riggs because it got so much exposure, so much attention, so much focus. But why did we get the focus? Why did we get the attention? Because I was, we were in the, I was in the men's arena. If you look at Sonica Sorenstam when she played in a PGA um, 2003, and she was trying Colonial. to make the cut at mm -hmm. Colonial. Right. For two days on USA Network, she was in every frame. For two days. Why? Because she was playing against the men. They never would give her that kind of attention on her own in the women's LPGA. They would not do it. So um, Babe Dietrichson back in, um, for 19, I think it was 1945 at the, the Riv in the LA, the Riviera Club. She played the PGA, mm -hmm. and um, that's why. That's one of the reasons we know, most people know her names if you think about women's sports, and that's one of the biggest reasons because she actually played in that tournament and got so much attention from it. So I knew this was an opportunity that I had to win. I knew, I knew I'd have a hard time living with myself if I lost. And it wasn't about losing a tennis match. It was about what I felt we might lose um, in, as far as society and, and things. And I knew if the women's tour, tennis tour could grow, the professional tour could grow, it's, it's global. Tennis is a global sport that we can make a difference. Uh, I wanted the men and women to be together, actually, as a union, and they, didn't, they rejected us. And that was a horrible time. So this was very important for me to beat Bobby. And it's amazing, every time I go out the door, every single day of, my, of the apartment here, because I live here in New York, uh, every single day somebody makes a comment about that match. <laughs> and I knew it was going to happen. Can you imagine going out the door every day if you'd lost? <laughs> and I actually, I actually thought about it. I, I thought about that. How is my life going to be? But more importantly, how can I make a positive difference impact that will be lasting? That, and it's so funny, a little tennis match got that... But that's why we're in the men's arena. And it's really, as you as a journalist, you must notice that. Absolutely. Let's talk for a moment before we move on to other subjects, which are near and dear to your heart, uh, because this is, as you just described, it, such a seminal moment for you. Your relationship with Bobby, great. Didn't end there. Why don't you tell everybody just to, uh, Stayed in touch. I, first of all, the reason I beat him because I respected him. And as a child, I love history. I knew every, I knew every champion. I, knew, I, had, I had seen old film of him. I knew all his uh, stories, funny stories about gambling and hustling, because he's a Southern California boy. I'm a Southern California girl. I used to sit and l listen to oral history about him, and absolutely just like a sponge, couldn't get enough. So when I got to play him, 
I had a sense of him as a human being, not just uh, a tennis player. I just loved him. And he and I uh, stayed in touch the rest of our life. Well, he passed away, but I talked to him the, the night before he passed away. And he wouldn't let me come and see him the week before. I was trying to get to San Diego to come. He wouldn't let me come. I don't think he wanted me to see him the way he was. And uh, so we did talk the night before he passed away. And he, he said, I guess we did make a difference. Because I kept saying, Bobby, this is not about money. This is about history. And he'd go, <laughs> OK. You know, he, he, but he finally said, I swear on this dying bed you know, <laughs> you know, in death, he said, Billy, we really did make a difference, didn't we? And I thought, oh, he got it. I love him. It's, he agrees with me. It doesn't mean uh, um, that that's right, but it felt good. It felt, I felt much more connected with those words. And we told each other um, that we loved each other, and that was it. But uh, So it was, it was really a wonderful uh, friendship. Now let's go back. You mentioned Southern California. Long Beach, of course, is where you're from. And uh, you mentioned a little bit about your brother, but yeah. the sports background you had, but you came from an incredibly traditional Oh, family. totally. Dad was a firefighter. Go get him. And uh, he was a police officer a little bit before that. Um, my mom was a homemaker at the time when uh, I was born. I was named after my father because he was uh, away on World War II. He was actually in Norfolk, Virginia, stationed. And my mother was worried he may never come home because if he was sent overseas or whatever. And... Uh, it was between Michelle Louise and Billie Jean. <laughs> and so my mother chose Billie Jean in case my dad didn't come home. That would, that would be his namesake. And uh, he wrote home to my mother and said, I think we're going to have a girl. You're going to have a girl. And I think uh, he knew. I don't know. I think he even said what day it was going to be born. It was incredible. And I don't, my mother doesn't know where the letter is. I go, Mom. <laughs> she said it was amazing. And uh, my mother's still alive. My dad passed away six years ago. Uh, my mom's 89. She'll be 90 in May next year, and uh, she's a sweetie. And my brother and I um, were very fortunate. They didn't really care for any good. They just wanted us to have passion for what we did and be the do the best you could do, you know, be the best you can be at whatever you decide to do. And uh, they gave us really good lessons in life. I mean, they really and they lived a, a life of uh, no debt. You know, if you can't afford it, you don't buy it. God. <laughs> you know, we're starting to hear that concept since the recession. Um, but they're children of the Depression. My mother used to go to bed hungry, and so uh, I hear their stories. And I think that's why history is so important. I try to explain that. I, think, I try to tell young people, particularly, the more you know about history, the more you know about yourself. And, uh, because you have to know how we got there, and then how do you want to shape the future? Very big. And we do that a lot with the Women's Tennis Association. And with World Team Tennis, we have men and women on each team. We, we always, I keep trying to. It's amazing. Young people do respond to that. Yeah. They do. Well, it, in speaking of that, it, so many sports today, no one, the younger generation has no idea about the history. But tennis, you see that. This, the Williams sisters, yeah, they you know, they're always talking about the past. They're talking, they're looking up about the box. About Althea Gibson. Right. But also, and also you, if you're in the box or some of Martinez in the box, whatever, at Wimbledon, They'll be looking up or they'll yeah, wave. Very sweet. Yeah, they really get it. And, and do you think that's because of, of you? I mean, of, of the fact that uh, y there was such a push for equality where other sports still don't have what well, you were doing I think back a generation we ago? May, my generation who started it made a huge, um, huge push to mentor. And my generation, uh, people like Rosie Casals, um, Ann Jones, the ones who really... Uh, stepped over the line and started the women's professional tennis. There's only nine of us. It was called the original nine. And we, we really knew we had to mentor the future. And I always wanted to try to keep the generations connected. Um, I think it's valuable, at, uh, the connectedness uh, to each generation, just like in your, within your family unit or whatever, I think is really what makes people tick. And um, we spent an extraordinary amount of time with Martina and Arbatolova, <clears throat> excuse me, and Chris Everett. So, and we said to them, you have to spend the time that we're giving you with the next generation. And usually by the third generation, it becomes a me generation. Uh, the first two generations, like even in women's soccer, the first two generations, I used to talk to Julie Foudy um, or Mia Hamm. I said, you'll have a huge influence on the next group, but it's the group after starts to break down. And it's so interesting, the WNBA, everybody I talk to says it's true. 
They said by the third generation, it's a me generation instead of a we generation. Um, so it's, it's been very, um, it's hard because the next generation after that was, uh, what was it, Monica Sellis and Steffi Groff, and it was really tough to get them to, but Monica's got a sense of it, but I was also Fed Cup captain and had those people on the mm -hmm. team. But Serena and Venus actually um, used to live across the street from the high school that I went to, Long Beach Poly, which is an unbelievable high school. I mean, uh, when you walk in, it says the home of scholars and champions up on the building. Home of scholars first, not champions <laughs> second. And I always think of champions in life when I read that. I don't think of champions, like sports champions. Champions in life. And so, um, so when I use the word champions, I mean in life. So scholars and champions, and then as you walk through the, into this atrium, above there it says, enter to learn, go forth to serve. And every day I'd read that and I would just embrace it and I would just hold on to it. And I thought, what an influence that had on me. And I had four teachers that made such a difference. So, you know, Mrs. Hunter in third grade, Mr. Bamrick in sixth, Ms., uh, Mr. May in ninth, my glee club teacher. Glee club's a good program now. Um, <laughs> and we were the geeks, but I didn't care. I loved it. And uh, 12th grade with Mrs. Johnson, who was my PE teacher. So I, had miss, that was, so I had two men and two women, which is ironic. I had two men and two women on my family unit. We got two men and two women at least on our team tennis teams. Think it didn't have an influence? I think so. Also, you were spending time in high school. Today's young tennis players just zip right along from, what, five, six, seven, eight years yeah, old right to a now camp? Now they can make money. We, we were making $14 a day when we became amateurs. So mm -hmm. there wasn't very much emphasis on it. And they wouldn't let uh, uh, us miss school. One, I was going to say, your parents wouldn't have let you miss well, school, right? My parents did not let me miss, except one day uh, they wanted me to go to a tournament in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was going to get a zero, and my mother went to the school and said, you know, she gets straight A's, why aren't you letting her go get half a day off to go play? Because the boys got to get off for football or basketball. And uh, our teams, mm -hmm. polo team, all of them, and they said, it's different, you're a girl. And <clears throat> my mother said, that's ter terrible. And I used to argue with the principal, Mr. Phillips, that uh, tennis was going to be a great education for me because it's global and I was going to be able to travel and have opportunities that these football players and basketball players would never have and uh, that they, he needed to let me off if I kept my grades up and uh, he wouldn't. So um, those are just little things that add up over time that get you irritated because it's just so foolish and, you know, the, the human, every human is such a, is such a, it's just each person is so important. So don't ever discount half the population. It's just, you know, that human capital is so important. Well, speaking of the half of the population, let's kind of segue into Title IX because, as you mentioned, of course, 1972, June of 72, signed by Richard Nixon, of all people. Remind those. those well, he's a guy from California, you know. I, I've heard of that, yeah. He was actually thrilled to do well, that. Well, and when people, when, you know, people, there's still about, you know, 10 stick in the muds out there who don't like Title IX. Well, you can remind them that it was Richard Nixon who signed it. But... <laughs> And like your dad, Republican. Right. <laughs> but he was on board from the get-go. He's my own personal Title IX. That's right. right. I had. But, and then it's almost like in the history of women's sports, it's a stepping stone. Title IX in 72, June of 72, September of 73. Mm -hmm. Of course, we've already talked about the battle of the sexes. But Title IX will turn 40 years old um, in a year, or in a half a year, just six, well. seven months. Um, where does it stand? What's uh, the, Title IX? the results are terrific. Well, you probably know more about it than I do because you're into it every day. Yeah, but, but people the, came here to the, hear the you. Little, so. That's all right. We can both. It doesn't matter. It's, inform, it's, it's information, and I think information is powerful. We're still about what our, my understanding is we're still $150 million behind every year in, in the scholarships and things. Is that correct? That sounds about right. It's yeah. about. It's yeah. about. I could be a little Maybe. bit over, a little bit under. But I think. You have an expert here. Um, I used out. to know. I mean, I, every day it, it shifts a little. Um, Everybody thinks we've hurt like men's sports, and it's not true. The athletic directors really decide what sports are in and which ones are out. So it's very personal. Um, like a lot of tennis programs have been dropped. Wrestling, there's certain aren't as considered as popular or whatever. And because girls don't have a football team in a lot of these schools, um, we don't have a football team, so let's say you have 85 scholarships that are gone immediately for the football. It used to be 105 all the time. Now they at least cut back. Mm -hmm. um, and most of the 
football schools lose money. Everybody thinks they make money. They lose money. They lose a lot. About over, I think about 90% of them. And the Division One will, will stay with the big shots. And um, so it's, it's very important that, um, that we still get opportunities. What's helped us have more opportunities is this proportionality. I don't know exactly why that. I mean, I understand why they did it. I'm not so sure I agree with it. I have mixed emotions about it. Because I don't like it if they drop, say, a men's tennis team. It gets me crazy. <laughs> and they'll say, well, it's proportionality. Like, let's say, uh, I went to school at Cal State LA um, because I didn't have any money, and it was pre-Title IX. And people like Arthur Ashe, who I think most of you, I hope you know who that is, and Stan Smith, who became number one, they were just 30 miles away. One had a full scholarship, Arthur, to UCLA and stand to SC, but nobody cared because this woman has to go to, you know, I had two jobs, which I thought I was living large. So uh, I did. I was thrilled that I had a job. I had two jobs and uh, to get myself through school. And, <laughs> but, and I look back and I go, how did I not just go crazy knowing that Arthur and Stan had full scholarships? I used to see them come to England after the NCAAs. We didn't have any of that. And I'm thinking, how did I, how was I so naive and said, oh, hi, guys, how did it go? I saw you did great or whatever, you know. <laughs> I didn't even dawn on me that I wasn't getting this. It was like, too. That was really uh, slow. But um, <laughs> Title, Title IX uh, is so necessary, and I just adore Edith Green, who is a congresswoman from, congresswoman from uh, Oregon, and, and uh, Senator Birchby. Uh, those are two of my all-time heroes. Patsy Mink from Hawaii, the first woman of color to come from, uh, to be in Congress. Um, I just love these people because you read the past, and Edith Green is really the person that thought about uh, girls should have equal education all across the board. It's just ironic, it was just stupid not to have that. And I love her for that. But when it came down to the vote, she actually left because it wasn't the way she wanted it. And this is where I transfer my love for Senator Birch Bayh because he was willing to compromise to get this darn thing started that had been through so many, um, I don't know, they just kept, you know, just redoing it and trying to figure out how to change it. And so finally we're at Title IX. It was going to be Title X. It was going to be, <laughs> had all these different things. <laughs> so anyway, it ended up being Title IX, but I love him for convincing everyone to get this in, and Patsy Mink, and I'm sure I'm uh, forgetting some others at the moment. I think Martha Griffith maybe. I love these people because they never get any credit. You never hear about them when you hear Title IX. But without Edith Green thinking about it for the first time, a woman before 1972, if she wanted to be a doctor and go to, and go to Harvard Medical School, they, I know Susan Love, who's the, who's the authority, doctor of Susan Love, the authority on breast cancer, wanted to go to Harvard. They said, we only have a 5% quota. You cannot come here. Now, we, and we used to say, why aren't there more women doctors and lawyers? Well, if you only have a 5 to 10% quota, <laughs> How the, right. how the heck are you ever going to have very, you're never going to have very many. So now we have the opposite challenge in most of the universities because now it's like 57% women. And now we don't have enough guys. And a lot of them is because the African American boys and the Hispanic boys aren't going to school. So we have to, to do something about that. Um, so those are things uh, that I care about. Um, I just think everyone should have an opportunity to be the best they can be. And, it's tough, though. You know, you grow up in an area, especially in urban areas, and you know about, what is it, two square blocks, This you think this is normal? It's not normal. That's why you have to get people out and travel and get away from their environment, and they start to see all these uh, possibilities instead of giving up on themselves and think they're going to die at 20 years old and get shot or something. Yeah. We, you, I know you, there's so many social issues you want to discuss. I love but it, yeah. yeah just, uh, for women, just sticking with women for one more uh, question, because... You are such a role model and such an icon mm -hmm. uh, for women, even as you've worked so hard to have the genders together in so well, many ways. But, I, but just real quick on the idea of the advancement of women. We're getting there. Because, we've got 15 because you've CEOs. Always, I, can't, I wish I had a dollar for every time you told me that we've got to have women in positions of power in the media, to in see business. see it, to be it. You have to see it, to be it. I keep telling the kids, you have to see it, to be it. So you need role models. You need people that achieve things and all across the board. So how are we Whether doing? it be science, technology, engineering, whatever. If you don't see enough people that look, that look like you, the kids want to see themselves, then you don't think you have a chance. And so it's very important um, that we make that possible. Uh, and women are very far behind. Still in engineering, I think we're 4% or some ridiculous. I'm reading the uh, Steve Jobs book. 
and of course the president of Aspen Institute. I want to thank Aspen Institute since uh, so it's it's, it's so Walter, funny. Walter Isaac. Isaac Wal yeah, uh, Walter Isaac. Isaacson. I love his Einstein book. I already read that, um, but I'm reading Jobs right now. But there's a person, a friend of mine in that book, uh, Ed Ed Woolard, who was former CEO of Dupont. He's hugely responsible for getting Steve Jobs back. In fact, when Ed was at Wimbledon, every single day he was calling Steve Jobs to please come back. And he came back. So um, that was important. But another thing, when women do something, they always say, well, thank you for doing something for women. You never say that to a guy. Mm -hmm. So that keeps our marketplace half as big as the guys. I want you to think about it. When people come up to me and say, thank you for what you did for women's sports, thank you for what you did for women's tennis, or whatever, that's not how I perceive myself. I perceive myself helping tennis. I care about tennis. I don't care if it's a boy or a girl. I care about, I know if I can get them in tennis, they'll have a chance to get a scholarship to college. Uh, it will take them out of their environment. They'll get to meet kids from different socioeconomic groups. Um, and kids will be friends with each other. They don't care. The parents might, but the kids don't care. Um, so those are very important things. And, and tennis being global, I think it's amazing to get in it. Um, I do want it to be more of a team sport. Um, I think children should be on teams. I think you should experience both, being an in individual and teams. But I think what really hurts women is we, they keep us at half the market when we, when we talk about things. You'd never go up to a male and, and say, thank you for what you did for men's tennis. I mean, does that sound kind of weird now? But, but it doesn't sound weird to say women, does it? That's wrong. This is one of my, irrit this is one of my irritants right now. So I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm tonight. Tonight, no, no. I've been very consistent. I'm starting to speak out on it a lot. It's bothered me for a long time. She's starting to speak out. And I'm like, uh, no. But this particular, no, this particular area, that this particular area, no, that time. it's both. Yeah. Anyway, are we going over? Do we, are we, no, no. I'm just teasing you about you're starting to speak out now. Um, no, but, about that. Yes. No, I, I got that. No, because um, it's half the market. They keep us discounted. Hello, chello, chello. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> I think this is a perfect time to open it up to questions uh, from the audience. And uh, mm -hmm. I believe, uh, we've got yes, we've got mics. we got mics, and good. We've got this you know, Winton, right here. Winton Marcellus, you had last year, I want to do a toast to him as well because I love him and I got to uh, do something for him in, his, in the orchestra um, over at Lincoln Center. I got to be the narrator when they uh, did a tribute to Mary Lou Williams. And uh, I got to be the narrator, and that was one of the, I went to rehearsal the day before and listened to them do rehearsal all day long. And I love jazz. I grew up with it because my mom and dad love it. And uh, I grew up to listening, hearing it in the morning. So um, I just can say what a great experience. And when I saw he was the first one to win this, I just love him. He's a great one. He's a great man. He's given a lot back to, um, you know, after Katrina and all that. And, he just, he's, he gives back. He's just a winner in life. I love him. Champion of life. Go ahead. Hi. What's the first question? Yes. If I can answer it. Or uh, just a quick comment me. also. I wanted to acknowledge you for one other talent. Uh, I never forgot your appearance on The Odd Couple with Bobby Riggs. I thought that was <laughs> terrific. That was fun, huh? My sister beat me in ping pong after that every, every time we played. But um, <laughs> I, I wanted to know wh wh where you see the, um, the uh, world team tennis going, your, your league and everything. I, I used to... I used to remember the New York sets back in the day. That's and what I, just, I played for. That's why yeah, I, you yeah. know that's why I'm a New Yorker. Oh. Because I played team tennis for New York. That's the reason I am a New Yorker. I would have never probably ended up living in New York if it hadn't been for team tennis. I represented New York for um, about, what, four or five years. Ended up getting an apartment. Have had an apartment ever since. Um, so, um, well, I own more than half the league. And, and I'm a small businesswoman, very small. <laughs> um, and we were in 11 markets, and we are in the month of July, and I would like it to, we're right, I'm try, we're trying to go through, we're in, examining the model uh, right now. It's fine the way it is. I would like to make it bigger and better and, and get more people to see it um, and also give back more in our community. We're, every, every single team has charity work. They have to give back um, a lot. And we want to be the fabric of the community all year long, even though we're not playing all year long as far as the professional aspect. And so that's what we do. And I don't think a lot of people know. It's more of a local 
because we don't have enough cities yet to be considered really what I consider national footprint. But I think what we do in our communities, we're front page in our community. I don't think people realize that, but we are. Except New York's a tougher one because you have the U.S. Open. Sure. But, like, but in D.C., my goodness. D.C. is just in unbelievable. The castles are sold out every night. Crazy. All year long they talk about it. They give back. We give back. I go down there. We give back all the time. I don't think people, you know, but we, the local places know. We, we're definitely uh, trying to give back. We work with the, the USTA is 25% owner. Uh, the USTA, uh, we started a 10 and under initiative, which we're trying to push for them as well in each one of our cities. We're trying to get more children into it to identify with it at a younger age. But uh, I love it because it's men and women together working. That's what you said already. But, um, I was going to say Thank something. Thank you. Else. That's the question. That was good. Thank you. Another question. We have, we have someone way up there. Ooh. We have University of Michigan, the Women's Sports Foundation. We do research together. Did you know that? You didn't know that, did you? It's called SHARP. It's, I don't know exactly. I didn't exactly. know I was through Title IX. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't. Yeah, no. No, but, um, no, but the Women's Sports Foundation is doing something with, uh, we, we bid it out. We wanted to have our research home because we've done research since, since 1974. And we went to all these different schools, and University of Michigan is our partner now, not just FYI. And, um, yes. I'm curious about the potential new young Americans that we can root for in tennis. This seems not to be very many, and why? How many of you have seen Waiting for Superman? <laughs> Sports are a microcosm of society. Same things happen to our tennis, or our sports, in competition with the rest of the world. I didn't have to compete with the rest of the world as a player. You notice they, you notice they say that in the, uh, in, in the Waiting for Superman docu? Do you remember when he said we didn't have to use to compete against the rest of the world? We didn't, and we didn't either in tennis. I mean, we're just a microcosm of society, so if you look at sports, you kind of figure out what's going on in the world. Um, we have to be able to compete against everybody in the rest of the world. If you think about tennis is the second most popular sport in Europe after soccer or football over there. We're definitely not number two in this country. And so you can see our challenges. Um, I think Title IX probably hurt the girl, girl, girls or women's tennis because usually girls will play tennis and now or golf. Or something. Now mm. they'll really go into all the team sports. But I... I knew women's sports hasn't, haven't arrived until we had team sports. So that was very important. And that's what the Women's Sports Foundation, we were really worried about it um, from its inception. We were really the guardian of Title IX, I think, is a, mm -hmm. and I think we really cared. And then Sue Roden's here with, I think, with WISE, well, which is a great organization uh, for wi women in sports and, and also entertainment. So they do a great luncheon every year. So, but the Women's Sports Foundation, uh, we, we care very much about, um, uh, about keeping Title IX strong. Uh, the research isn't sexy, but we think it's important. And then we have our uh, Go, Go, Go program. So uh, we're doing some really good work. We have travel and training, which is really huge. Are you going back to tennis? Are you in favor of more of that national team, which I know you've been very involved with Fed Cup and, and uh, I'm all Patrick Mann? I'm Second a team role. person. So should we be finding young talent to your question? No. What it, here's, how, well, here's what I would do in tennis if I had, if I could just do it. This is my 45-year mantra. And the <laughs> USTA is doing more of it, but here's my mantra. When a child signs up for tennis, he or she are put on a team. Immediately. The very first moment. Because first, first experiences, if you, if you think about your own lives, go back. I remember the first time I ever played tennis or went and got instruction and it changed my life okay I want to make that kind of impact on a child when he or she signs up the way they do for soccer or anything else they're immediately put on a team they're given a t-shirt little shorts or whatever that's it go tennis does not do that here's 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 what parents say about their children now they're in sports my child plays let's just say lacrosse and soccer and Billy this is trying to make me happy which makes me sad is <laughs> and my child takes a lesson every week. 
And then I go back, and if I'm talk, let's say I'm talking to the child, talking with the child, I say, how many hours a week do you spend on your lacrosse or your, your favorite one? Oh, I practice at least three times a week. How long? Oh, about two hours. So that's six hours a week for that sport. And then I go, do you play tennis or what do you do? Oh, I take a lesson, usually on the weekend. Really? How long is that lesson? That's an hour. Now, if I'm doing something six hours and I'm doing tennis an hour, which one do you think you're really going to choose? You're going to get much more proficient at the one you're putting six hours on in. And so why would I ever want to play tennis? I'll play it a little bit, but I don't want to be champion. I, I'm not playing it enough. And if, you've got to make it, you've got to make tournaments where you only have to drive, you don't have to stay overnight. That's the way it used to be when I played as a child. If, it were, if I had to play in today's situation in tennis, I would not play because my parents, couldn't, my parents could, didn't have, couldn't afford it when I was a public park kid. Um, but you've got to make it easy peasy and you've got to make it affordable. Somehow you've got to keep your costs down for the parents. And um, when I used to go to a tournament, we'd drive, I'd play, we'd come home that night. It's very important that you do that. But I'd put them on a team, I'd put the children in a circle, I'd say, you name your team. So if they, the socialization process starts immediately with the children. Okay, so in a circle, they're gonna name, because now they're equal, because they're, I put them in a circle, because it's equal. And then I say, what do you want to name your team? And they name the team, and they'd always do all their skill drills. I'd get rid of the, get rid of the word lesson in our sport. Gone. You're gonna, we're going to do skill drills, practice, hit, whatever you want to call it, and I'd have the children do everything as a team. Okay, and then you set up competitions. You can do singles sometimes. Team tennis, we have two sets of singles every time. You can put four sets of singles in. We're very adaptable. We know how long, the reason we developed team tennis, we know in two hours on two courts, you can play a match. It'll be over. You don't, you don't have to say, well, it's four all and we have to get off the court. This is for indoor tennis. Because we worry about indoor and outdoor. And during the winter, when you live in a place, you've got to be able to afford to play indoors. Somehow, You've got to make it happen. But if a child's really good, there's people who will help them, always. If a child's talented in something, people gravitate towards them. I, whether it's music, art, I don't care what it's in. Have you ever noticed that? They want to help them? They're going to be really good? But I want the masses to play because it's healthy. I want to keep children moving. That's why tennis is such a great lifetime sport. I think we, yes, the question Somebody way up there, there, I believe. Thanks. And it's a little hard to see. You don't have to talk about sports. You can talk about it you want. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering if, uh, you know, in the old days, was there pressure on, on you and, and women in the game to behave in a certain way, whereas yes. maybe the men didn't have that pressure? You know, like Nastasi and Connors yes. and McEnroe could be bad boys and, and glorified for it, or is, you know, did yes. you feel that you had to You're absolutely put on, on the money, yes, because girls have different standards to live by. And as a jock, you want to spit just like the guys, and you can't. <laughs> or do other things, and you can't. I won't go there. <laughs> we just try to imagine it, what guys do, you know. <clears throat> <laughs> you know, we can't do that. We, we have the same challenges, too, that they have. Some of them, not all of them. But <laughs> so my brother and I get laughing so hard on this because we just crack up. Can you imagine if a girl did this? Um, Serena, for instance, they keep harping on Serena's, uh, you know, going crazy. Well, Roddick and McEnroe, those guys, to your point, Nastasi and all, that was a daily occurrence, and everybody thinks that's great. The guys do it. But if a girl, oh my God, you're, you're toast. Can you imagine? Okay, you've got uh, Magic Johnson. He announces he has AIDS. He goes on to do great things. Schultz uh, from Starbucks gives him $150 million to help him out, to for his businesses. Uh, you'll, if a woman, had the same story, she'd be a slut. I'm sorry. Just think about it. Well, you think I'm wrong or not? I don't think so. So, is that Leslie? Yeah. Hi, Leslie. Leslie Allen, great player on the tour. <laughs> I always yeah. loved Leslie. <laughs> so, um, so, I just, yes. Yeah, I guess. We, Why I, not? We've got another question right So, there. anyway, these are just things that just drive me crazy. <laughs> We have a microphone. One second. I'm sorry. Just you project well, though. But you never know. If a, I know, Tizi. Your work um, off, well, I guess it was all part of tennis. And I, I'm trying to remember, I saw you in Philadelphia years ago, maybe 78, 
I can't remember, wow. and it may have been after you came out, which was a huge thing at the time. That would have been in the 80s. Maybe the early 80s. I was outed. You were outed. But I, I'd like to focus on that for a minute, because sure. besides tennis, you've been very outspoken for LGBT rights, and you've made a Absolutely. huge difference. And I want to know how difficult that was initially, because, again, it was not something that was talked about. It certainly was not something that was accepted. And, you know, we look at what's gone on in New York recently with um, marriage equality, and now mm -hmm. it's 2011. But if you go back to the late different. 70s, it was not. And the generations before me exactly. had it much. So every generation has gotten slightly better. You um, made a huge I difference think there's still there, over too, a and thousand. I want to thank you. I, oh, sorry, I interrupted you. No, thank you. Um, I would never out somebody about anything unless um, they're ready, I mean, as long as it's good. I mean, it's okay. So, I grew up in a homophobic uh, family, um, so I was very homo homophobic myself. Um, I was afraid. It wasn't that I was ever against uh, uh, gays, lesbians, bisexuals, or transgenders. I was always for them, but I was scared. Um, and when I got outed by Marilyn Barnett, who I had an affair with, and I'd been trying to get a divorce from my husband for quite a while. He never wanted to. Larry King, no, not that one. Um, <laughs> uh, I used to, I wanted a divorce, but in a way there was emotional blackmail there um, because I was, a, uh, he basically said things, some things to me like I could tell that he wanted me, but he wanted me to stay with him. And uh, and I wanted to go to therapy, he wouldn't go, so that really got me crazy. Uh, I needed us to go. Um, so I was having all these mixed feelings and trying to figure out who I am. Um, and I still, even after uh, the trial, when I was out, at Marilyn Barnett uh, sued me. I was the first galimony uh, lawsuit ever. I have a lot of firsts. I mean, you know, <laughs> this one is an odd one, but I, well, no, it's not odd. It's just the first. Um, so the trial was horrible. Um, I was I still hadn't really talked to my parents um, properly. I tried to bring it up a couple of times, and they would get all weirded out and walk out the room or get. We just it was like you know when you have that two thousand pound elephant in the middle of the, and nobody talks about it. It was one of those, and every family knows what I'm talking about. There's always dysfunction, and all, that was where I think the only area that we really had tremendous dysfunction. Uh, but any time something shame-based, as all of us know probably in this room, it doesn't work. Something's not right. So um, I had an eating disorder, and I went, uh, I was really in a bad way about when I was about 50, 51. I, was, I wasn't getting it right. And I finally went to Renfrew in Philadelphia where they have um, an eating disorder place. And I remember walking across this line in the cement, and I, er, um, Asphalt, cement's not actually, this, that's part of asphalt or whatever. Um, concrete or whatever it's supposed to be called. I know that, I know that's, uh, so anyway, I just remember thinking, um, when I step over this line, I'm going to surrender because I have to get well. I have to get comfortable in my own skin. Somehow, I have to get there. And that was the greatest thing that ever happened to me because I just surrendered. And we had group therapy on the hour, by the hour, by the hour. And it got down to my eating disorder. I think we had a lot to do um, with, and I'm a binge eater. I do not, uh, I'm not bulimic. I don't purge, which is why I get heavy sometimes. Uh, when I get stressed out, I eat more. And it's my way of pushing my emotions back down. And my, I feel my pain in my stomach. If you ask each one of yourself where you feel your pain physically, it really helps to start getting in touch with who you are and what's really going on. And uh, living with many anorexic nervosa teenagers, I was the oldest one there at 50. But at 51, I finally had it out with my parents. And my therapist said something to me that changed everything. Lynn Siegel's her name. Uh, I still call her once a week for my crutch. Uh, and she said, when are you going to take your power back? I said, what do you mean? She says, you've given all your power to your parents and to everybody else. And for that, that was, she, that was a teachable moment. She must have, I must have been finally open
what I needed to do because she zinged right in there because they're trained, they know how to do this. And I, that changed my whole life. I took, finally, at 51 years of age, I took my power back. I took, had it out with my parents. They're, they ended up being great, finally. My mother took the longest. My brother was fantastic. Randy was the best from day one. He just said, why don't you tell me? I don't care. As long as you're happy. He was fabulous. My brother and I are very close. And my mother was late. My dad said, she'll come around. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So it was a really long, hard process for most of my life. I mean, I'm 68 now, and I only got comfortable when I was 51. Uh, and being outed is the worst. That put me almost back in the closet in some ways more. Um, so it was, really, it was really terrible. I would never do that. It got thrown out. The judge said it was, it was as close as extortion he'd ever seen. Yeah, because she wanted money. Uh, what else is new? And um, so it was really, it was really an amazing journey. Um, so how can I not try to help someone else be more comfortable with their own skin and have our laws? Uh, why can't we be protected as much as anybody else uh, in our community, our LGBT community? So. Also, I got to know Renee Richards. She's my ophthalmologist. Do you know who Renee Richards? She's a transgender. She's my ophthalmologist. Um, she played on the WTA tour, and it was a huge uh, situation years ago. And I told all the women just to calm down. I said, "All right," because I, I, I must say I was very lucky. If I called a meeting, they showed up. So, um, <laughs> no, I mean they didn't have to. I was just lucky. Um, but they chose me as their leader, so that's what they got. Because they did push me to be a leader. So I ended up being a leader for, for them. And I would just call a meeting. And I said, you guys, we have to get this uh, resolved. I said, let's just calm down and figure out. They're going, we don't want her in the dressing room. We don't want this. We don't like it. So I went and talked to Renee for four hours. Total enlightenment. Just absolutely adored her after that. As a human being, she's the greatest. And I just decided, OK. And then I went to doctors and said, tell me, is she a woman or a man? What is she? Because we've got, we got to make some decisions here, because she wants to play on the tour. And he, they said, absolutely a woman. I said, OK, that's all I wanted to hear. And I went back to the women and said, suck it up. She's playing. Let's go. And to try to help, I went and played with Renee in doubles. I said, Renee, would you play doubles with me, please? She said, great. So we started playing doubles, because I figured, you know what? Let's go. And some of the money that Renee and I won, I put into a Karen Kransky Sportsmanship Award. And just there's so many good things that come from these challenges that we have. So, and, uh, so now she's still my ophthalmologist. <laughs> <laughs> so she's, a fan, she's one of the greatest in the whole world, by the way. I am so sorry. I'm sorry, Susan. Off. Thank you. No, no, <laughs> we just thank you. This could go on and on, and we thank you. We're, um, it's inspirational, truly. And Cheers. We, we still thank thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Christine, thank you all for thank coming. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good. Thank you, family. We thank the Dish family. Exactly. Thank you.